guys, and welcome back to Gabbing with Jessa. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a book review on the first book that I pre-ordered in so long. I can't even remember the last time that I was this excited for a new book or a new release or anything because I'm finally up to date on what is and isn't getting released. Today, I'll be doing a spoiler-filled review on The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Suzanne Collins is the author of the very well-beloved Hunger Games trilogy consisting of The Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and Mockingjay. And after nearly a decade of those books being published and the movies first being released, she has released a prequel book set 64 years before the original Hunger Games. Of course, being 64 years before, we don't have any of the familiar characters that we were expecting when we first heard a prequel trilogy. I first thought it was gonna be Haymitch, but then when I heard it was 64 years before, I was like, no, that's no way. He was in the 50th Hunger Games and 64 years before would be the 10th Hunger Games. This book follows President Snow uh, as he is an 18 year old living in the Capitol. And I know a lot of people were nervous about this at first because he is the villain of the Hunger Games trilogy. We didn't want to sympathize or empathize with him. When I was first interested, when I first heard about this, I'm like, that's not what Suzanne Collins is gonna do. I don't think that she's gonna make us empathize with him just because he is the villain. I know that I'm definitely not the majority, but I love village and origin stories because I'm always just so fascinated on the paths that they took in their lives to end up where they are, whether that be maybe something they're innately born with, like maybe some kind of a drive, or if they had events that happened to them. And so I was so fascinated to read this. I could not wait. So like I said, this follows the events of President Snow during the 10th Hunger Games. During these Hunger Games, they decide to have a mentor-mentee program with all of the tributes going into the games, and President Snow is assigned a young woman from District 12. This story just follows his drive, his ambition, and helps us understand why he became who he is. Now, I still don't feel any sympathy or empathy or anything for him because he is the villain, he is the bad guy, and I went into this knowing that and I went out feeling the exact same way I still do about him. Like I said, this will be a spoiler filled review. So if you have not read the book yet, I recommend doing that first. Or if you just don't really care, you can stay and join us for the discussion. One thing that I really loved about the beginning part of this book was learning about the difference of the games. We know from Katniss and Peeta, they were basically treated like royalty. All the other tributes, they stayed in these very nice mansions. They had these lavish interviews and training sessions and they were well fed and everything like that. But that is the exact opposite of what is going on during these games. They are treated like prisoners, which I mean, they kind of are, but they are like, they have shackles on the whole time. And even at one point they throw them into the monkey cage at the zoo, just so they can be basically animals for the capital to watch that's what it is and that was so surprising to me i loved learning about how the games transformed from what they were into what they are now a lot of how the games are we find out throughout this book is because of snow and he says oh it should be a law to watch the hunger games because none of them ever do they should be treated better they should it was so fascinating to read that he had all of these ideas and that's why the games, he is basically the co-creator or like creator 2.0 of the Hunger Games. We find out that the girl is Lucy Gray and from the start, I loved her because she is there during the reaping in like this flashy, colorful dress and she's just, she sticks a snake down the District 12 mayor's daughter's neck because she's like laughing at her. And I, I love her. I know that she's going to be a contender and a fighter and I loved her. What was really fascinating about this as well was how much went on before the games that I am still so surprised that they even had the games in the end because they didn't even have the full set of 24 tributes. One of the interesting things that I thought during this whole zoo scene 
was after President Snow, who I kept wanting to call like Cornelius the whole time or Coriolis because I, what is his name? Coriolanus. So he goes to the zoo and he's like feeding Lucy Gray and then his buddy, Sejanus, who I love as well. We'll talk about him more later. They go and they're feeding the tributes. So the other mentors kind of get the idea too because they want to have that good relationship that they see forming between Lucy Gray and President Snow. However, one of the mentors, I think her name's like Ar Arkine, I think that's how you pronounce it. She taunts her tribute from District 10. I believe her name is Brandy with a sandwich and she ends up eating it. So of course this makes Brandy very mad and she just slits her throat right then and there in front of the entire crowd. And then of course the peacekeepers come in and they end up killing her because she just killed a mentor, but it was just crazy I just don't I don't know I knew from that moment that this was going to be a very different Hunger Games than what we had seen before I also thought that when they were all touring the arena it was very interesting when the bombing went off and of course this not only killed a bunch of tributes and mentors but some tributes tried to escape and they ended up getting killed by the peacekeepers and Lucy Gray helped saved Snow's life so now he feels kind of like in debt to her. And this is where like the weird little obsessive romance, I guess you could call it. I call it more like chemistry rather than romance, even though I knew that this kind of relationship thing wasn't going to last because he was so possessive of her. Like from the beginning, he's like, this is my girl. This is my tribute. But then later on when he starts, you know, having feelings for her or whatever, like I'm like, this isn't what he thinks love is this is he says he hasn't been able to find anyone before but that's because he is just so obsessed with control and power and you can definitely see that throughout the games throughout the relationship throughout the book like it the ending of it didn't surprise me before the games even start uh snow offers the idea of betting and sending food and water and stuff into the arena and so you could definitely see like the gears starting to form with these simple ideas at first into what eventually becomes the games and i really like seeing that part of his brain i really like seeing how he could come up with a variety of things for dr gall who absolutely terrifies me by the way she was so scary during this whole time and i don't know you could just see how he wants to have better like like i've said before control over everyone and i thought that was really interesting and i really liked how we got to see that side of him as well so the first third of the book it's divided into three parts the first third is basically everything from finding out the tributes to all that wacky stuff that started and then you know prepping for the games the second half of the book or the second third of the book excuse me is the actual games itself and a lot did go on, but it wasn't what I was expecting. There were definitely exciting moments and there were definitely, you know, backstabbings and betrayings and stuff. But because the arena and the gamekeepers really didn't do anything, like it was just a bland arena that they had used previously before. It kind of sounded like kind of like a, I don't know, like a sports stadium, maybe. That's, the, that's kind of like what I was getting in my head and the game makers didn't add anything to it. They didn't force tributes together in the end like some of the other games. They didn't have like the cool, you know, strategy of like in Catching Fire when they had the clock arena. Like they didn't have a lot of that. They didn't do anything of that. Yeah, Dr. Gall does in the middle of the game, she sends in the snakes, but really that's all that they did. There wasn't anything fun or exciting or I don't know, it just wasn't, it just didn't really like click with me the way the other games did and no wonder nobody wanted to watch them because they were no fun like they didn't really like do anything so janice entering the arena i thought was really weird because i don't know they still have a focus on security with the peacekeepers and everything but i'm like how was he able to get in i don't understand was it something that like Dr. Gall made him do or like let the peacekeepers get him in. And then, so that way they can send snow in, she can then send like snow in there. Or like, I don't, I don't really know where this 
like I don't know where the security was for this, but I do love Sejanus. I love what he's trying to do. He is a district boy at heart, even though he is now currently part of the Capitol, and he is just such a he's such a sweet boy, and I love him. He was definitely my favorite character because he's always trying to do right. He might not think it through very well, but he's always trying to do good, and that just makes my heart happy. Throughout the games, I think that Lucy Gray, well, at first when I was first reading this, then when I got to the third part, but I thought that she was definitely trying to play a more defensive game rather than an offensive game. She didn't really want to kill anyone. That was the vibe I was getting from her. And then we had the whole thing with the snakes come in, and of course, Snow cheated by dropping the handkerchief with both his DNA and her DNA into the little snake cage in the lab before it was brought into the arena so she was safe from the snakes but she used it in defense of herself when treach i think it was yes treach when he was coming at her with an axe so he she used the snake as a defense mechanism and i also think that she used the rat poison in the compact also from snow as more of a defensive mechanism rather than an offensive mechanism i don't know she just kind of reminded me of fox face from the first hunger games where she was just trying to use strategy rather than like i don't know she didn't really try to kill people she was just using more of survival skills and i thought that's what lucy gray was intending to do but in the third third of the book i have a little bit of different opinions but that's what i was feeling throughout the game she was more of a defensive player rather than an offensive player the games end up with lucy gray winning and it was very anticlimactic i didn't really like i mean i was happy for her obviously because i was rooting for her so i guess in a way i was kind of rooting for snow but i wasn't rooting for snow but i was rooting for lucy gray because she was great and then, you know, Snow's very happy about it. He's like, yes, I'm gonna be able to attend university now because I'm gonna have my money. But then we find out that he cheated and he gets caught by the Dean and Dr. Gall. And so we have the handkerchief with both the DNA on it. We have the compact with the rat poison. And we also have, um, I think another handkerchief that they found just showing that he was smuggling food to her when their intent was like to starve them, which I don't know why, because then you're just gonna have people die of natural causes and no wonder nobody wants to watch your silly games. So because of this, he is sent off to District 12 because that's where he wants to go because he has been assigned to be a peacekeeper. So this starts the third third of the book with him being a peacekeeper. Now I felt that this could have been a completely separate book in and of itself because it just seemed so different from what we had read before because obviously it was like you know the games focus on the games but then this just kind of seems like way out in left field and not that I didn't enjoy it it was a little bit slow but I still enjoyed it because I really enjoy Suzanne Collins's writing I feel like that after every chapter she ends on some kind of a cliffhanger or a big moment and she just <laughs> makes me want to keep reading even when it's very late in the night and my eyes are practically closed I want to keep going and I really enjoy that about Suzanne Collins's writing I really like that about these books but I don't know this third I'm still trying to grasp my feelings on it because it was just so out there and so random like I said this could have been maybe a novella in itself and I would have been happy with it it just seems so random but again I enjoyed it because of the building of the backstory of snow whereas in these first two thirds I was starting to be like okay like I can see where he every time he was going to say or do something that I thought was going to be good I was rooting for him and of course he wasn't going to do that and I was so disappointed every time and I'm like I shouldn't have been because I know what's coming but I don't know like I don't know I'm still having feelings about this final third but let's talk about some of the major events one is snow and lucy gray's relationship now when the more i was reading it during this section where i thought it was actually genuine at first reading it now i was like no he's way too possessive and this feels more like a summer fling rather than like being in love in a relationship or anything like that like i never got that in this final third at all. Also, my boy Sejanus becomes a peacekeeper so he can be with Snow because he just knows that this isn't what Snow wants. And oh, my sweet boy. And he's planning to escape with some of the rebels, which like, that's what Snow kept calling them the whole time. But I never really called them rebels. They just wanted freedom they wanted to escape he's trying to help them out and it's just my so, so sweet boy but of course snow doesn't like that at all he doesn't like the idea of the rebels and you can see more of future snow coming out of him in this third which is why i also enjoyed it too we have the moment where 
during one of the concerts at the Hob, Sejanus goes out to a little shed to discuss weapons and stuff, and Snow is like suspicious of him. So he, you know, follows him in there and stuff. And then so much happens. We have, you know, the mayor's daughter coming in and the Billy, whoever, I forget his name, um, who is like, I guess, Lucy Gray's old fling thing, who's now going off to, after the mayor's daughter. And she, like, she likes it or whatever, but the mayor doesn't like him. Makes sense. But then Snow kills the mayor's daughter, and then the other guy kills Billy, whatever his name is. And I'm just like, what is going on here? And then, of course, Snow knows. He's like, crap, I shouldn't have done that because now I have my DNA, my fingerprints and stuff on the murder weapon. We have to hide these away. So they did. Snow doesn't know where they are, but now he knows that they're away, but he has this feeling the entire time that he is going to get caught. And then Snow betrays my boy Sejanus because he secretly records the plan uh, with a Jabber J and sends it off to Gray. So he, not Gray, Gall. And oh my poor boy Sejanus. Then he then gets an execution, which makes me so sad. Like Sejanus was such a good boy. He didn't deserve it. But as soon as he came to be a peacekeeper, I'm like, he is not making it to the end of this book. Like you can, like he tries to make it seem like he cares, but you know that he really doesn't because he doesn't like what the rebels are doing. He didn't want them to break the one lady out of jail and then just run away. Nothing would have been bad. It, like they were just off to their freedoms, but no, Snow didn't like that. And so he betrayed the person who considered him a brother and then he gets hung and I'm just so sad. Oh, one kind of positive thing that I like didn't mention yet was that Lucy Gray loves to sing and we see so many of the songs like the hanging tree song we see in there. Um, down in the meadow we see and that she either created or sung herself and I absolutely love that. I'm a sucker for slight like mentions of future things like with Lucky Flickerman, which I kept wanting to call Lucy, um, being the weatherman turned uh, moderator for the Hunger Games, which I loved. We see, you know, few last names here and there. We see references to the Primrose plant, the Katniss plant. And yes, I know she's trying to be slick and it's not slick, but I love it. Here's when I think that Lucy Gray is a lot smarter and thinks a little bit differently than I originally thought. I think that she definitely figured out that the, that Sejanus died because of Snow betraying him. I don't know if she knows how he did it or anything, but she knows. So I think that when she's like, let's run away together, and Snow, you know, was freaking out after Sejanus's death because, you know, the murder weapon with my DNA is still out there somewhere and I need to get it or else, like, I'm, I, I can't continue on. I can't go and be an officer. I can't do anything because the murder weapon is still out there. And I think Lucy Gray is a lot smarter than we give her credit for. And not that I didn't think she wasn't smart, but I think that she definitely was playing Snow just a little bit. So she convinces the two of them to run away together. And I think this was just her plan the entire time. They sneak off to the lake in the boathouse where them and the Covey all played earlier, like a few weeks ago, and he finds the murder weapon and then everything just clicks, like literally a flip of the switch and he's like, I'm ready to run away. And then having, you know, dig worms out of the ground or whatever, he finds his murder weapon and he's like, I'm ready. I'm not meant for a life on the road because it's gross because I'm from the capital and I'm very picky. This is his chance to be free. So he throws everything in the river and then he's like, but Lucy Gray is still out there. She left to go collect food or something and she hasn't returned. And he, this is like driving him crazy. So he like runs off into the woods. He claims that like a snake, she sent a snake after him, like she did on Treach, that she's really evil, that she really, really wasn't this sweet person. So he like shoots around in a circle with the gun before he chucks it into the river. 
and we hear a screech so we're not sure if Lucy Gray is dead or not. I really hope not. I hope she's out there somewhere. Not that she like does anything to Snow because we know that like he lives. I just want her to still be alive. This one person he thought he could control and do anything he wanted to with that she was his and not like a mutual relationship or anything that she is still out there and it is the one thing that bothers him to this day that he cannot control. And I think that he relays those feelings later on to Katniss because when she starts to go and do things, this is just, I think, a reminder of him that he can't control everything that he wants to control. And I think Katniss brings that out of him. And I think that reminds him of her knowing that, hey, she could have gotten away. Snow dumps everything and then is off to military training officer school or something in district two but then he ends up getting to the capital and he's like did i miss my stop they're like no we were told to bring you here first and then dr gall the scariest lady ever is like oh did you enjoy your summer project basically it's like oh this was just a summer job we just sent you here to get real world experience and welcome to the university and i'm just like what is going on this ending was so fast and then we had the epilogue where he's in his first semester at university and he basically comes up with the entire premise of the games. He comes up with the fact that they should be treated better and well fed and more bedding and stuff like that. And I'm just like this 18 year old in his first fall semester of college creates the Hunger Games basically, or what we know of the Hunger Games now. I loved the twist at the end. So throughout the book, the Dean absolutely hates Snow and we don't really know why. We know there was some kind of a falling out between Snow's father and him. And we find out that under Dr. Gall in their college days, I believe they had to come up with a plan to get rid of war or stop it or what we should do to punish the districts for the war and like just these two kids drunk one night basically came up with the hunger games or the dean did at least he's like hey this is what we should do but of course you know he's drunk off his rocker and the next morning he wakes up and he's like okay that was fun and silly but like we shouldn't do that that's morally wrong but then Snow or Snow's father goes and turns it into the Dean, into Dr. Gall. And like, that's the reason why we have the Hunger Games. It's literally a drunken reason. And I think that's so funny and well, not funny. I mean, the Hunger Games isn't like, you know, good or anything. It was just something that the Dean created as a joke, essentially, but it's in the Snow blood. For this and like it doesn't surprise me that his father was the one to basically start the Hunger Games but gave credit to the Dean so you know it doesn't look bad on him and then Snow was the one to improve the games and make it what it is now and I loved that I thought it was a great twist I thought that it completely made sense for why Snow is the way that he is because you know the whole nature versus nurture debate I think that it definitely makes sense that it was also in him but that he was also influenced by it and I loved that. What makes me so mad probably the maddest throughout this book was that Snow is still riding on the coattails of Sejanus's parents like he's like oh yeah this happened it's sad and then his parents just keep providing him with things they bought back the the apartment they keep giving him food and money and stuff and i'm like he killed your son he is the reason why your son is dead and oh, it just makes sense for snow because of the control thing because he is a control hog he needs control in his life and oh my gosh i can't believe that was the part that made me so mad so mad the entire time oh my gosh and then of course the book ends with snow slipping in some rat poison to the dean's like drugs or something like that the the medicine he's taking i think is what it is and that's it and i thought i it was quick at the end there were slow parts throughout the book but i thought it was fantastic do i feel empathy or sympathize with him absolutely not but it was still a dang good book. Literally, I finished this book and I was like, oh, well, shoot. <laughs> and like, I don't know. I very much enjoyed it. I'm still trying to process a lot of 
the things that happened, it was definitely something I needed. It was definitely something that helped me and I loved it. So I gave the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes four out of five stars on Goodreads because of the pacing, it brought it down a little bit because there was, you know, some things I was confused with, some things I had to read over again, and some parts it did feel slow, but I enjoyed it so much. I want more, maybe not of Snow, but maybe some other books. I wanted a Haymitch book, but basically in Catching Fire, that was Haymitch's book, we figured out everything. Maybe like a Phoenix story or like any other tribute story, whether that come in a book, I would actually really much enjoy like a collection of short stories about each of the games for the main victors that we know. That would be really cool. I still loved it. I think that, yes, there's gonna be a lot of negative reviews because people don't want to read the mind of a villain and that's completely understandable. So if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, I wouldn't recommend this for you. But if you are a Hunger Games fan, I do recommend that you at least try it and check it out. And let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, keep on gabbing.